Hannah came to my father in 1931. When father died, my two elder brothers were fighting over who was going to get Hannah. She said, I don't care. I will cook for her. I won't cook for you. And so she came to us. Of all of us kids, Therese and I were the only two Hannah would let in the kitchen. The rest she'd hit with a ladle, you know, out of my kitchen. Bow! And But for some reason she talked to Therese and I. Because we would watch what she would, we would sort of strain in it to see what she was doing and she'd say, come closer. We'd uh, ask her a question and she said, would you like to learn to cook? And we said, yes. You take a piece of haddock. <laughs> Smoked, of course. You mix up some corn flour and milk, make it nice and thick, put your haddock in the thing and steam it, throw it on a plate, throw the white sauce over it, lots of bread and butter, bingo, you got it, honey. I was scrubbing the floor in the scullery. Anyhow, I was uh, singing One Fine Day from Madame Butterfly and next thing I know I'm sort of lifted up by the midriff, dragged off and plonked on the Dean's desk and this rather large nun says, the child can sing. And the bishop sat back and looked at me and he goes, child, sing. And I cried. <laughs> so anyhow, they took me back to the scullery and left me on my own and I'm back to scrubbing the floor again. And <laughs> anyhow, I start to sing again and next thing I'm up again and I'm taken into another room, plonked on top of a piano with this large nun saying, the child can sing. And so I became one of the school's sopranos. <laughs> we were doing Samson and Delilah at school and our producer, Brother Stanislav, said you're playing Delilah, you're tempting this man, you know, you don't want, you don't want him to go back to his, to his village, you want him to stay here with you so you can find out the secret of his strength. So tempt him. So I'm kneeling by this chaise lounge with Samson laying out on it there, and I'm running my hands up and down his body, and of course he's only wearing one of these little, little short thingies. Anyhow, he has to sing the next aria because I'm singing softly awakes my heart, and he has to sing the next, the next aria. He had to do it laying down. He couldn't stand up. I wonder why. Grandmother had arthritis in her knees, and one of the wives of one of the gardeners told her to wrap her knees in corks. So she sent off to the, the wine merchant to get some corks, and we used to wrap her knee in corks. Lo and behold, the swelling went down. An old wives' tale that seems to work. Mother used to get dreadful nocturnal cramps, and another Jewish lady told her about putting corks in the bottom of the bed to stop nocturnal cramps. And so I remembered that when I started getting these dreadful nocturnal cramps, so I put some corks in the end of the bed, and. Kevin says, what are you doing that for? I said, to stop these bloody nocturnal cramps. He said, you bloody stupid bitch. And I said, I'll try anything. And they worked. It all started off with mother. She says, you look like a girl, you act like a girl, you sing like a girl. There's half a dozen dresses up there that no longer fit. She says, go out and earn yourself some money. So I did. And father took me to this government officer in, in Brisbane. Father's sitting there and the fellow's writing this thing out and he says, and what is your son going to do, General? And he says, uh, he's going to be a female impersonator. What? <laughs> I can't register a 13-year-old child to be a female impersonator. He says, you haven't seen my son, have you? And he, the guy says, no, I haven't. Richard, get your tail in here. So in I pops, and he looked at me, and he said, that's a boy. Picked up the pen, wrote out the license. I was doing Lena Horne's I Love to Love at Tucky's Port Hotel in Western Australia. Um, I'd just come off stage and Mrs. Tucky, she says, come in child, sit down. So I sat down, she said, I'd like you to meet somebody. And I said, oh, how nice. And she said, I'd like you to meet Lena Horne. And I went, oh God. And there she was standing there and I said, I hoped you enjoyed my rendition of your song, ma'am. And she said, darling, I've been done by lots of people, but you've got my breathing and my timing down pat. She says, I loved it. You can use it any time you like. And so I did. 
Now, it all depends how many you're cooking for. You know, if you're just cooking for two or three people, you probably get uh, 250 grams of the things, you know. Uh, throw them in a pot, you throw some mixed vegetables in there, a bit of soy sauce and salt and pepper and onions and garlic and, you know, boil it all up. And then a bit of corn flour for thickening. Now, that's the good Jewish version. If you want to bring it over to the other side of the fence, you throw in a bit of bacon. Beyond the Lights was made back in 1960-something or rather, I've forgotten the date. I was playing twins, one gay, one straight. Anyhow, it was confiscated by the police after we finished shooting. Uh, and it was all because in one scene we are in the bedroom I'm laying there like that, David's laying there like that, and he starts to roll. He got that far and it was cut to the next morning, where he's sitting on the side of the bed and I got one leg out the other side of the bed, so I was going, oh, that was nice. <laughs> that was pornographic, according to the police. Anyhow, he said that he'd seen me at the Green Cockatoo, and... To my surprise, he'd, he'd, rec he'd even recognise me, which most people didn't. And um, he said that, you know, he was attracted to me, and I thought, why, I'm a fella? And he says, you're kidding. <laughs> and so I got myself a big bronze tax, and, <laughs> and that lasted for 14 years until he was killed in a plane crash here in Australia. So that was probably the first sad thing that came into my life. The second sad thing was my father's death. And, and then, of course, the third sad thing was Mark's death. Mark came back into my life um, while I was at the AIDS Council and surprised me with uh, looking so thin because he was uh, a well-built man and a master builder and he'd lost a lot of weight. And uh, I sort of looked at him and said, uh, do you have the dreaded lurgy? And he said, what makes you say that? I said, you've lost so much weight, dear. And he said, yes, mother, I do. And I said, right, now, what have we got to do to look after you? Towards the end, he had to have uh, a pethidine injections quite regularly, and I'd get a call at three o'clock in the morning saying, mother, I need another shot. And here would be this mad woman on a bicycle with negligee flying in the breeze, pedalling down to his place to give him his bloody shot. So people must have thought I was insane. Johnny brought Mark's ashes back with him. They cremated him in, in Queensland. And um, we started gathering people who were going to go to the uh, scattering. We got down there and I looked up and there was a hawk sort of circling. It was like Mark saying, you know, this is the spot, Mother, and this is where we, where we are, I want you to do it. So that's where we did it, at, the, at sunrise the next morning. My sense of humour comes from my grandmother. She had a wicked sense of humour. My sense of place uh, comes from her. Um, I know that at certain times I do have to uh, be very undesi and very Marie Desiree.